mean, good grief. It was a weird one, wasn't it? And yet here we still are. Okay, a couple of housekeeping remarks to make first of all. This event is being recorded and broadcast live via Facebook. You'll see it on our Facebook page, which is not considered to be news. So there you go. Um, a feedback survey will also be sent out tonight. So I encourage you all to let us know how you think this went. Give us your thoughts on any improvements, any future topics that you'd like to see us cover. And any, you know, if you want to do member demos or presentations, we really want to, to hear from our own member community from, um, either a great network you you uh, installed that works perfectly or even one that you installed that went badly. We want to hear the war stories as well as the great achievements, folks. Or even if you want us to do some peering socials, the good old, hey, my network's this, this is the ASN I have, here, here are my routes, and this is the content that your, your customers and friends and users can reach if you connect to my network. Now, throughout this evening, we will be taking chat and we will be taking, so we will be taking questions and we will be monitoring the chat window and the Q&A uh, window at the bottom of your um, uh, Zoom screen to make sure that if there are any questions that you've got, any burning issues that you want to make sure are into the, uh, into the mix, post them in there and we'll put them forward. Of course, there is an incentive to stay through to the very end, and that is that we'll give away a lucky door prize to an attendee this evening. People have really liked the Lucky Door Prize. And frankly, with my own personal extensions to the uh, Wi-Fi recently, I might have appreciated some of these cute little devices. But anyway, let's move on. Let it, do let us know if you've got any thoughts and feedback, folks. We do really want to hear them. Okay, the next event we're planning is, is going to be on uh, BGP fundamentals and how to get the most out of your peering service. We'll take you through some of our um, gra uh, monitoring and graphing and so forth so that you can actually tweak your traffic a bit better. Some of the, the other tools that we've got. So we haven't yet fully scheduled it because I was kind of thinking we might do some regulatory stuff in there as well, given there's been a few things on the horizon there. But anyway, mid to late April, keep an eye out for us for it and we'll let you know. Okay, another quick one I need to mention too is that the the Internet Association of Australia board recently adopted a code of conduct that applies for all our events, really just to keep us all safe and sound here. So in summary, please be respectful to everybody, uh, be accepting and support others and help them all to participate. And if anybody can't really play nicely or behave nicely, we will unfortunately call the bouncers in uh, and you will be removed. This applies to everybody who attends. Um, if you think you're being harshly judged by this, there is an appeal process that you can invoke, but we won't be letting people back in at the event itself. Anyway, that's the fine print. We all want everybody to be happy and supported in these things because we really want this to be a great contributing forum to the industry and to the community more broadly. Okay, so the Internet Association of Australia. Oh, better click go there, uh, Nick. Make sure we are live on Facebook by now. <laughs> So are we all systems go? Fantastic. Yes, we're all systems go. <laughs> so uh, here we are now at our 2021 technology outlook. Um, I want to know if our networks will survive another year like 2020. Will it be bigger? Will it be better? Will there be more? Will there be less? Somehow, I don't think we're going to see less traffic on our networks. But let me introduce our panellists, whom I'm really thrilled to have on board with us. They're fantastic, all three of them. I mean, truly, folks, we've got yet another rock star panel. I was thrilled. First of all, let me introduce Professor Lyria Bennett Moses. Uh, Lyria is the Director of the Allen's Hub for Technology, Law and Innovation, and a Professor in the Faculty of Law and Justice at UNSW. She co led the uh, Law and Policy theme in the Cybersecurity Cooperative Research Centre. And frankly, I've had a lot of really good discussions with her over the years about some privacy tech and other tech and some very deeply personal tech too, which we won't mention, um, that happens to be connected to the internet. Um, not mine though. Um, so Lyria's research explores issues around the relationship between technology and the law, including the types of legal issues that arise as technology changes, how these issues are addressed in Australia and other jurisdictions and the problems of treating technology as an object of, re of regulation. And she published this really good book last year called Artificial Intelligence, Robots and the Law, a great read. Um, anyway, she's been working on other legal and policy issues, which I'm sure she'll touch on relating to law enforcement and so forth tonight. Um, Trevor, Trevor is a, another great journalist and one of Australia's leading te technology commentators. 
He's worked in media since 1995. It's experienced in providing news, insight, commentary, and opinion on consumer technology across radio, online, podcasts, and television platforms. And he's a great attendee of the old consumer electronics show year after year. Um, uh, unfortunately, you had to stay home this year, didn't you, uh, Trevor? Yeah. Although not quite, as I'm sure he, he'll let on. Um, I think I saw uh, a weird shower head that is Bluetooth enabled with powered by the, anyway, we, we may or may not get to that. Um, Trevor edits a, uh, a lifestyle website, EFTM.com, uh, and also produces and hosts two weekly podcasts, uh, appears on over 50 radio stations across Australia each week and daily on the, cha on the Today Show on Channel 9. Um, and you can see where you're normally able to find him. <laughs> Last but not least, of course, is Professor Katina Michael. Katina is a professor at Arizona State University, holding a joint appointment in the School for the Future of Innovation in Society and the School of Computing, Informatics and Decision Systems Engineering. Also the director of the Society Policy Engineering Collective and the founding editor-in-chief of the IEEE Transactions on Technology and Society. Uh, Katina is a senior member of the IEEE and a public interest technology advocate who studies the social implications of technology. She's held over uh, held 13 annual workshops in the social implications of national security space and shared three international symposia on technology and society in Wollongong, Toronto and Phoenix. As the senior editor of the socioeconomic impact section in the IEEE Consumer Electronics magazine, um, she is really up on the actual nuts and bolts, or dare I say, bits and bytes of how all of this tech works. It's just, and the impact of it all. So anyway, I'll stop rabbiting on. And I think it's time we introduce them to have some opening remarks. So first of all, I'll um, ask Lyria to give us your opening thoughts on where are we at? What's happening? Oh, you wanted to share some screen, didn't you? No, 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 it's all good. I, I, I thought we had an unwritten agreement that I was going to go last and everything, but I'll... I'll uh, <laughs> um, well, I can, you can go last if you like, and we'll make Trevor go first. <laughs> no, I, I, am I going first? That's fine. All right, you go, Trevor. That's good. <laughs> Look, I, I, I'm, I feel completely out of depth amongst this panel, I'll be honest, but that's okay. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll stick to my ground and, and leave the experts and tunneling and networks and peering to, to, to the experts around me. I actually think 2021 is going to be a fascinating year because at the, if you think back to the very start of the pandemic, one of the biggest questions I got was, will the internet cope with what we're going to have to do? Students at home, working from home and all that stuff. And I, I am really kind of excited about the fact that we made it through. We made it through almost faultlessly. And I think as a nation, we should be really proud of that. And so I think now it's a matter of growing upon that. And if I was to Kind of pull out a couple of things which i'm looking at for 2021 in that space i think 5g is just outstanding in terms of the way it's going to headline 2021 um i switched to to the big telco at the point of the iphone launch because i really wanted to get a sense of 5g and the impact it would have and it's staggering to me how quickly it has grown um, not just in availability but in in profile and you know, i think apple knew that they were going to bring the clout to the party and i think the telcos are glad they did so that everyday punters are talking about 5g now like they never have before um what's fascinating i think to me is that people don't yet know what 5g is for and while it's ready uh, while it's growing we still haven't really answered the question of what it's for and as they start to discover what it can do and what it's capable of is when it's going to be pushed to the limit and pushing 5g to the limit is going to end up pushing other parts of our networks to the limit and i think that is something we need to watch both cautiously and excitedly, because hopefully it'll, it'll bring new innovations in apps and streaming and, and connectivity. And that probably leads to the, the big one, which we'll definitely talk about over the next little while is the internet of things. And while I normally deal in the space of, you know, smart home internet of things like light bulbs and things like that around me, it's really going to be the next level of internet of things where, you know, traffic lights and, and cars are talking to each other because of the, the high speed connectivity we have. So, I think that that level of connectivity is going to both um, excite us, but also challenge us a bit because it's a genuine alternative now to the NBN for people. So with, I think it's, we just passed 8 million homes connected to the NBN, 4 million still to go. It's a viable alternative for people to go, actually, I might go for a more portable option that means that I can move from house to house and not have to go through the drama and the rigmarole. So that's exciting that we've got a viable alternative to fixed line through our mobile networks. But I think the one thing, if I could pick something that's going to push us to the limit in 2021 and beyond, is 
streaming, but not just Netflix and Stan and Disney Plus live streaming. Like we have seen an explosion in the use of streaming for live events, whether it's, you know, the catch up channels using like the nine now, the seven pluses and all that doing live TV, but seriously Stan buying rugby um, as a sports rights, spending who knows how much money on that and putting that entirely into streaming challenges KO, which means that we've got a competitive landscape in streaming of live sport, which means they're only going to push each other. They're going to push each other hard. And we're going to have that situation of everyone's own little network. And this is the thing I have with people is it's all well and good to be a stand subscriber or whatever it is. But if your network at home, and we've always got to remember that network is a sum of all its parts, the home, the, the cabling in the home or the Wi-Fi in the home is the vulnerable, vulnerable part of that network. So yeah, I think 5G and live sport are the things that kind of excite me most about, you know, this, this space in 2021 and beyond. That would be my thoughts at an opening level. Oh, thank you, Trevor. That is interesting. I have to admit the first time I read the specs for 5G when it was first being proposed around IEEE and other circles, actually, I thought, now this is some crazy fantasy. They, they were talking about 100 megabits per second. What was it, 1,000? I can't remember now. With you know, sub-millisecond handover between base stations and you could travel at 100 kilometres an hour. It was this repetition of the 100, mm. 100, 100, you know. It was this crazy targets. Okay, so let's hear from Katina. What are your um, thoughts here? Well, it's, it's very interesting, Trevor's remarks, and uh, I'm not going to disagree, except that I'm in regional Australia at the moment. I'm coming to you live from Kiama, New South Wales, and uh, you might find my connection a bit sketchy, even though the library has uh, probably the best connection, upload and download speed in the whole area. If I do start to break off, I will just revert to the public Wi-Fi. So I'm going to argue we've had a lot of drop calls in our 3G mobile network, purportedly 4G. Uh, sometimes we can't get through, SMSs take sometimes about 30 seconds quite often to get through, and I'm talking about a local uh, line here, not an overseas American number. Uh, I'm going to say our internet sort of at the busy hour time of traffic comes to a lockdown and standstill again, even though the areas I'm talking about are highly uh, piloted in terms of, uh, you know, the NBN uh, early on, and we receive and, and enjoy some of the best speeds on the South Coast. I would purportedly say better than most of Arizona where I teach, um, but it's still not what I'm used to in Australia. So this misnomer that everyone has equal access uh, and has the same and enjoys the same download and upload speeds is 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 difficult uh, for those of us on the South Coast to, to comprehend. Um, additional to that, uh, there are topics that we'll get into uh, later as the, the day, the night proceeds, but uh, I want to argue as well that um, this mentality of uh, move fast and break, th break things is, is going to actually uh, be a paradox that we say, well, we don't want to move fast anymore and break things. We want to do things properly. I mean, we've seen large scale government implementations of various things, whether it's robo debt scandals or it's COVID safe apps uh, in compromising situations where uh, one could argue about their effectiveness. Um, and the question then becomes, do we need to be more deliberative in our processes in the design and development and deployment of these technologies? Uh, there's a great book written in 2013 by Mark Hurst, who talks about customers included. And our customers are not just based in Sydney, they're also based in rural Australia. And sometimes when it takes you know, a few minutes for a megabyte to be sent uh, successfully, you have to think about equality and equity, uh, universal service obligations, and much more on the regulatory side but is this the year for the mass market IoT take up? Well, I'll tell you something, the manufacturers sure hope it is because chip manufacturers are betting their bottom dollar as they look at the costs of production of these new, uh, very miniature devices at the nano scale uh, and just above. Uh, they're wanting to flog off a lot more product because if they don't, they're left with a product they can't really sell. So their hope, uh, at least to keep the tech industry going on the manufacturing side, is to keep selling, selling, selling more and more IoT devices. I mean, IoT was around when I started my PhD uh, in 1997. It was just different facets of IoT. But definitely, I agree with Trevor on the 5G, 5G connectedness, almost hyper-connectedness, almost localized kinds of technologies where some of that processing power takes place on the edge device, not really at the core. Um, and so. 
I know this sounds like an oxymoron, but it would be a step away from cloud computing towards edge devices doing the computation, sometimes tethered to the body on body worn devices, personal, personal area networks or body area networks. And so as we start to claw into IoT within the smart cities context, how will that change us? Is it the internet of us, as I once reported uh, at an ACMA conference at Redcoms? Um, and finally, is it finally the time for broadband everywhere? Well, yes, that's the promise of wireless. That's the promise of satellite technology. And that's the promise of fiber. I don't believe it will be one technology offering this uh, connectivity everywhere. I think we're going to have to look at morphologies. We're going to have to look at density. We're going to have to look at the needs of the local community um, and really step up. I mean, when we're talking about uh, Aboriginal Australians having access to the internet or rural Australians having access to the internet, what do we mean by that? Um, access and logging on uh, doesn't actually mean access. Sometimes speed is variable. And we really have to think about redefining as things like the pandemic have knocked us about, redefining the busy hour of traffic, redefining telecommuting and looking at um, different kinds of traffic patterns because they have really changed uh, and the needs have changed. So I'd love to think we're all gonna veg out on sport, Trevor. I reckon you're half right when we're not doing work or attempting to do work, but there's also, as you said, education and those other needs that are perhaps unmet at the moment. Ah, oh, thank you for that. Um, Katina, with your talk of um, nano devices and the chip manufacturers going nuts, I, I have to think about the garbage, uh, like the, the e-waste phenomenon. I do, will we, well, that's, we, we'll need to discuss that one more, I think. We, we need to let Katina, uh, let Lyria have a, a turn. Um, actually, when you talk though about uh, regional Australia, Kiama was one of the first areas to get NBN. I remember giving all of these what is the NBN good for? What is broadband good for presentations to people in the Kiama district and meeting everybody and how exciting it all was and, and helping them and having the, the NBN team come over and grab my handouts to give to people because ours had more consumer information than theirs did. But anyway, oh, and the busy hour, well, our stats uh, across the exchange show all sorts of interesting stuff about the busy hour. Uh, our first Life Under Lockdown presentation looked at how the networks are withstanding the pandemic or withstood, withstanding. Hmm. And we saw this, what was a steep curve up throughout the day with a big sharper peak around the evenings is now this big flat hump right throughout the day and then a bit of a spike in the evening, except on certain days of the month when a certain games manufacturer releases an update worldwide. So anyway, we better let Lyria have a turn here as well. Lyria, please give oh, us a I was only too happy to wait, Norelle, I assure you. No, um, and the reason for that in fairness is that I'm not a, a technologist and I'm not in the industry. So I'm the worst possible person. That is so not true. How many times have we debated the courts going over the legal, the, anyway, anyway, go please. No, 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 but, 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 but going... my point is, is that I don't know if I'm the person to say, you know, how quickly 5G, how quickly IoT, not the expert on that. But I do want to raise four issues that I think, you know, social issues, if you like, that I think are going to be the really big ones that, that we all need to come together and help answer. The first one is about power. Um, and one of the things, and I know we're going to come back to this um, later on, but one of the things that um, really struck me um, in the whole recent Facebook um, um, Australian government um, discussions was that essentially what it seemed like is almost a negotiation as if on the same level between a government and a company right so so Josh Frydenberg calling Mark Zuckerberg to try to work out you know what could we do and negotiate it and change the law to sort of adapt and it struck me in the course of that that if we're talking about things that way then we need to also and I know this has also been a conversation in the literature for a long time but we need to also start thinking about the kinds of things we require of governments in terms of tempering their power and think what do we need to do for the really big powerful companies that have the same level of power in many ways. So with government, you know, we can think about things like the rule of law. You know, you can't make retrospective legislation, but of course companies make retrospective policies all the time and don't even have to tell you they've done it. So there's a lot of real questions there, I think, about power and about what we do about when an organization, and particularly we've seen internet organizations get a lot of power. The second one, and these are all sort of overlapping and related, is democracy. Um, and we've seen, 
And it's related to power because we've seen, for example, Twitter's decision to take down Donald Trump's Facebook, to take down Donald Trump's Twitter account, um, as and the impact that that has had on the conversations that take place in U.S. politics has been massive. Um, who, you know, who gets deplatformed, if you like, who gets taken down, how those decisions are made um, is really important. But even more broadly than that, the fact that in the end it is corporations that are deciding or helping to influence what people think is the truth, right, on a whole range of different levels and what that means for democracy. So my third one is security. Um, we've already spoken about the Internet of Things. Um, and to me, the big question there is the security question. Um, you know, and I, I think it's often a question that, you know, some people think about a lot and talk about a lot and other people don't think about it all. Um, most lawyers I've spoken to don't even think about the fact that they have IoT devices in the same room as them when they're sitting at home talking to their clients in really deeply confidential conversations. That's just an example from lawyers. Um, but I think it's a broader problem. We need to really think about, um, about what, you know, how these devices work, how they can um, you know, have, have far less security settings than many of the things we do protect. We, you know, think about our computers and we update their virus protections and we do all of those things, but do we do it for every internet connected device that we might be encountering in this world of tiny gadgets um, with, with sort of minimal power needs and embedded in your clothing or embedded everywhere? I, I don't know if we give it the same attention. So I think that's another one um, that, that I'm watching out for. And the final one, and again, I promise these were all related, is, is the privacy questions. Um, we have, um, privacy law that I think most people agree isn't working. Um, and I know we're going to come back to this, so I'm not going to say everything now. But, um, you know, the Australian government is looking to reform the Privacy Act, but it's doing it in a really rushed way. There was a whole range of, um, you know, calls for submissions at the end of last year, one of which was the Privacy Act, all of which had about a I think maximum six week turnaround time for organisations to respond. Um, you know, if we're really going to rethink this stuff, and I think we need to, we need more time, we need more conversations with the public. Um, and we really need to think about where we want to go and what we want privacy to look like. So they're my four big, I suppose, social issues, as opposed to technological ones. Well, that's quite a mighty list there, Lyria, of course, I would expect nothing less. Of course, we all had a really big laugh recently when that poor lawyer couldn't undo his cat filter. Uh, and yet the irony that struck me as we all looked at that particular video right around the world was it is illegal to record legal uh, court transmissions. That, that was there in the top corner of that screen, this note that it was not legal to record the, the, the proceedings of a court. And yet there we were looking at that recording right around the world as that poor fellow was uh, completely humiliated and I'm not a cat, really, I'm not a cat. So, yeah, the laws of the laws of the land and the requirements of our legal systems are not necessarily being implemented in our technologies, even though they're being taken up and used widely, widely, widely. Okay, then. So what was my next question we I had to pose in here? Um, I, I did have up here, let me just share it again. What are there any big changes that people see on the horizon then that we haven't perhaps mentioned already? Trevor, you're off mute. Perhaps you should go first on this one, or do you need to think yeah. about it? <laughs> no, look, I, I think I, I probably touched on that in, in a great way in my opening. I think that, I, I mean, I know that, you know, stand streaming sport isn't a, you know, a, a mind-numbing governmental regulatory issue, but I think that the reason I bring that up is because it's going to be new to a lot of people. And what I do is I look at what happened in 2020, and you had a whole range of new people exposed to Zoom calls, for example, and now they become a default for many people because they've been exposed to it. So they're happy, they're relaxed, they know what it is. It's less of a friction point. And I think streaming um, is the same. Lots of people, especially uh, feeling for our mates in Melbourne who were locked down at the most extreme, discovered Netflix, Disney, Stan, all those things, for, possibly for the first time. And we've seen numbers, we don't see numbers from Netflix, but we saw Stan's numbers quite dramatically up um, as reported yesterday. Those people who were exposed to it are now going to be more willing to do it more. And so that is going to grow and it's going to grow at an extreme rate. And 
that is the stuff that hits that peak time. That is what's that that big cliff, as you mentioned, that's dropped off because we're watching stuff. We're doing things that aren't just a single activity. So, yeah, I do think that um, video will play a big role in network demand, network capacity usage. Well, that, that one's another interesting one too, that, I mean, in the past, pay TV pretty much flopped in Australia because generally broadcast TV was good. Well, you know, by all standards, <laughs> acceptable, <laughs> but it was generally seen as better than what you got on the pay TV channel. So generally people didn't really take it up. And now it's a must have. A lot of the, mm. a, a lot of people, you know, my elderly mother included, want to see what's on the streaming service, not what's on, not what's on broadcast. Yet it must be pointed out, we were watching our traffic stats over um, New Year's Eve and the streaming services had their usual peaks up to a point and then all of a sudden they plummeted down and the ABC <laughs> kicked yeah. off as the broadcast of the fireworks went to air. All hail free-to-air TV. <laughs> Yay. And the national broadcaster pulling its weight with the fireworks. <laughs> you could really see that, um, that change in traffic. Okay, so what were my next bunch of questions? And unless Lyria or Katina, you want to add to that? Are they, you think the video is the big deal or um, or anything else? Uh, I'm just going to hop in there and say more change. Change is ever <laughs> present. And uh, perhaps a plug for Lyria's book, uh, can we keep pace with that change? And the answer is no. So new ways of regulating. And I'll let the expert talk about that. Yes, there it is. Um, I do recommend it. Um, and this is the thing that while we're being in the throes of a pandemic, uh, we have seen absolutely everything come to the fore, whether it's low fidelity solutions or high fidelity. And those high fidelity, as a technologist, interests me the most. Uh, you know, having threats of anklet bracelets, uh, bracelets in Western Australia for those who defy self-isolation orders uh, to the value of $3 million in the Western Australian Police Force. Uh, having drones being threatened during the AFL Grand Final in the, back, in the backyards of Melbournians in case they had 10 or more people gather. Having geofencing uh, kinds of hints, you know, locking you to a minimum bounding rectangle. Uh, having things like automated number plate recognition systems being used to look at the direction of travel and to predict whether your travel was essential services. You were going to a pharmacy or you were getting local supplies from a supermarket to keep your family going. Even additional things um, that were converging technologies. Uh, we've even gone to QR codes now, and whether it's being stored in service New South Wales for those of us in New South Wales, or it's being stored at a supermarket chain like Wool Woolworths, or it's being stored at a third-party Groupon style, you know, specialist QR code uh, marketing platform. Who knows? Uh, the New Zealand government chose to go on to the actual handset, but we're losing control and we're not asking those important questions when we're signing those terms and conditions uh, who has time while they're checking in to figure out where their data points are being stored but as of october last year 28 million points had been recorded via qr when qr wasn't even a thing in new south wales yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. and they logged twenty thousand locations so you've got breadcrumb chronicles of where people have been and of course a lot of that data is bogus which actually is garbage in garbage out and actually that uh, unclean data that is purportedly being cleaned by these marketing companies and reused in ways we would never ever dream of this is actually an issue because Katina could be Jack tomorrow and Josie the next day and Josiah the very next hour and may well not be placing her dependence in order or uh, logging in so We've got to be cognizant that we're always going to have more tech, more shiny gadgetry, but what is actually working here? And it's good old fashioned approaches to hand washing for the pandemic, wearing of masks, uh, sanitization, and manual contact tracing, which we've seen. And so here we are with a government that's saying, well, our COVID safe app worked, and they kept saying that, and they said it again, and they said it again for six months, and then 12 months almost now, but it hasn't. And we've got to come to terms with these high fidelity solutions and what actually works. And I want to just take that a little bit, though. We have had some benefit from a lot of this tech. And I mean, while sure, yeah, the COVID Safe app didn't quite work, um, I want to give an example. Now, this is straight out of, out of China. 
I, I know somebody whose elderly mother has, uh, well, had now dementia. And at one stage, she actually left the home and was out wandering the streets and the family were going nuts looking for her. They couldn't find her anywhere. They're in a, a very crowded town. They couldn't find her. They went looking and looking and looking. They went to the police to report her missing and the police officer said, uh, you need to go to this particular shopping centre and, uh, and speak to security there. There you'll find your mother, um, which is all very definitely Big Brother and it's the implementation of it. But from the family's point of view, they were quite reassured by the fact that they found mum and they could they would otherwise not have found her for some considerable time. So this type of surveillance tech can be put to very good use. Mm -hmm. uh, and certainly I know in the past when we were advocating or discussing the concept of, of surveillance technology, it was in the context of a public health emergency that we perhaps granted a few outs. <laughs> Narelle, yeah. if I could jump Please. in and, and give potentially the unpopular opinion for many, <clears throat> I would argue the COVID Safe app worked and it worked very well. Um, for a couple of reasons. It was downloaded in great numbers and never before has a government service been so quickly adopted, right? Now, where it failed um, was that in, in part, the technology was early and it, it needed to evolve. And it did evolve, unfortunately, by the time it got to the, the true best, case, best use case, we kind of had moved out of the pandemic broadly in Australia. The other problem is the Victorian health officials were simply not trying to use it. So in the height of the moment when Australia needed it most, Victorian health officials were not trying to use the COVID Safe app because they didn't have their contact tracing in the right place. We moved past COVID Safe so quickly because we got back to a new normal so quickly. And again, I am 100% with Katina on the QR codes and the concern around where that data was being stored. My mom runs a, a pub in regional New South Wales in the middle of utterly nowhere. And you know, she had she, we were going to shut the pub because she didn't want to take people's names down. I created a, Q, a Google form. I created the QR code, yeah. and I felt weird about the fact that the data was coming into a Google spreadsheet, and you know there was no real you know data protection policies in place. But we were deleting the data as we were required to after 28 days. But what were the other companies doing and were they using for marketing? So for us to then pivot very quickly in the, in the scheme of technology, we pivoted very quickly to government-based QR apps in a couple of states. And the Service New South Wales app is, is basically bulletproof and it evolves when needed to things like dependence and stuff to the point where it's hard to be Trevor one day, Josie the next and Alan the next because it's a Service New South Wales login. So... If we had the benefit of hindsight and the willingness to do it, we would have created what Service New South Wales have now in a federal app that also did the Bluetooth tracing that we we're able to do and switch it on in an emergency. Unfortunately, the look back is so many people are disgruntled by it and the way it went, but I think we should look at it and go, we, we did pretty well to adopt and use technology in the height of a, a, a once in a lifetime uh, situation. Can I come in, Narelle, on, on a few of those points, both that Katina and Trevor made? It seems to me, and I'm, I'm going to start at this at a fairly high level, that there's a lot of, and, and actually, Narelle, to your point as well, about there's some technologies and surveillance technologies that people really benefit from, right? Mm -hmm. And I think one thing we don't yet understand well, but really need to, and really should have by now, because we've had a long time on this, is what is it that people want to protect, right? what are people's actual concerns right and 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 that is we we don't just have to use the word privacy or the word surveillance as a package of concerns that are all intersecting with each other so part of what people are worried about when people use the word privacy is actually discrimination would be a good example right people are worried that if their information gets out someone is going to treat them differently because of something about them right so that so, so the concerns are actually quite intersecting um, so what is it we're trying to protect and what is it people want protected? And then there's, there's something else going on, which is what is it that we're actually protecting? Because I'm prepared to bet that if you look at what all the laws do, what the Privacy Act does, and even the, the much lauded GDPR does, it's not actually coinciding with the answer to that first question, right? It's not actually solving the problem that people want solved. We sort of are looking often in the wrong spots. Um, so, you know, the, the Privacy Act, if you like, protects against information collection, information disclosure, and, and so forth. Um, and that 
I'm not saying that isn't part of the story. It might well be. But what people are actually worried about is less, oh, a computer system somewhere is going to know something about me and, and that's going to somehow you know, be embarrassing or whatever. That, that is less the concern than it is that that information is going to be processed in such a way that yields a negative result for that individual. So we need to sort of think in that way. We need to watch the right things. I want to go back to what Trevor was saying too about the sort of history of um, the sort of COVID responses and the role of, of the app and other things in there. Because it's another circumstance where we're watching one bubble and we're ignoring the other. So when the COVID safe um, app came in, there was actually a whole amendment to the Privacy Act to create what might be the most protective data, you know, the, the most data protective regime invented. I think, you know, even beyond GDPR levels of protection for this data, right? It was, it was, it was, you know, no one can use it, even the police can't use it. It was, it was incredibly protected. And with, you know, the government's focus was on the app. And whether or not the app worked or whether it would have worked had the pandemic got worse, let's leave that question for a minute. That's where the focus was. In the meantime, pubs in all over, you know, all over the country are thinking, <laughs> oh, you know, we have these registration requirements and we've got to collect all this data. You know, I'm not such a technologist. I know I'll use a Google form or I'll sign up to this corporate that I don't even know where in the world it is that's advertising its data holding services or whatever. And everyone's creating an app on everything. These restaurants are suddenly asking me for everything from my name, my address, my date of birth. Um, I'm surprised they didn't go for mother's maiden name because that's normally a good question. But, but you know, all of this information, right? That the restaurant doesn't need and that the contact tracers don't need mm. and that it's going somewhere, right? And at the same time, normally in those situations, I'd be like, I'll just lie. Right? I'll give them a bad phone number. I'll give them a bad email. They don't really need that information. But of course, they really did. Right? This was actually a problem that needed solving because ultimately, I wanted to know if I was exposed to COVID at my real live phone number. So you've got you've got the sort of big bang legal solution over here, and this problem percolating over there with no one really watching. And yes, eventually the Service New South Wales app came in, and that has solved that sort of like my information could be going anywhere right now um but it hasn't actually got the same legal protections funnily enough as the covid safe app did right we haven't put in place for the service new south wales data the hyper mega levels of protection why not should we uh, no one's even looking at it or asking those questions so so sorry I've, I've talked for a bit long but but wrapping up i guess what i wanted to say is that we've got a real problem of the laws doing all of these things and some of those might be good things um, but it's not necessarily the problem people actually want solved. And it spends way too long looking at bauble over here and ignoring the bigger problem that might be happening over there. I've never seen you so excited about something, Lyria. <laughs> I, I get, I, I'm always excited. I, I think that's, that's a good one. one. Yeah, yeah. That, that's good to hear, though, that they did actually make those extra steps to secure the COVID safe data. Uh, and and you, you, you're absolutely correct that why does a restaurant need to know what my date of birth is? Is that just because they're likely to get more than one Narel Clark coming to dinner that night and it's they so need to they tell can me market about? to you and send you a birthday special offer? And I, 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 honestly, bravo for that little, I don't want to call it a rant. It was, it was a brilliant was statement. Fun. It was awesome because it really does sum up a, a very interesting privacy point because that legislation was so rock solid, but yet we all relinquished our privacy when we checked into a pub. <laughs> Yep, and hopefully we can all visit your mum's pub too sometime. That should be good. Um, okay, so we've got stuff about power and the negotiation between the the um, uh, the sites. Let me just, I think we've probably covered some of the other topics here about added, what are our attitudes of technology? Are they changing because of all of this? Um, I, I think you're saying we are our, our attitudes have changed, that people have become so much more comfortable with tech. Honestly, I'd never thought I'd see my elderly aunt and the rest of the, yeah. that side of the family Zooming on, on, on having Zoom cabaret nights every month. <laughs> that was extraordinary. But some of the questions around, yeah, identity and data ownership and who owns it. Um, and, of course, this moving into that this world of deplatforming content and controversy is one I wanted to get to because as network operators, who a lot of our members and a lot of the attendees will be, we have been seeing more and more that the 
uh, the law enforcement and government and perhaps even society have been pushing that requirement to act back onto the network operators. And it's coming further and further up that stack, whereas, I mean, sure, they hid a lot of their constraints and requirements inside those dense terms and conditions that went on for longer than any Shakespeare play. But now we've got sort of the the, the domain name system being asked to pull out um, whole swags of domain names just because there's something going on there or or blocking you know, we're getting back to blocking ip addresses um and and unplugging things because there might be something evil out there somewhere uh, and i i certainly find that very difficult as a as a ceo of a telco <laughs> that i might have to go and unplug some of our best members and best customers and upset a lot of others because somebody somewhere has deemed uh, under a warrant granted by the Administrative Affairs Tribunal um, that I ought to unplug something because something was evil. Yeah. <laughs> and all because Trevor wanted to watch the football. I don't know. <laughs> Actually, you know, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll defer to uh, more expert people on, on such issues, but I just broadly on that, I think that it's it's fascinating to me to watch the net neutrality debate that existed much more maybe three or four years ago, um, kind of simmer away or ignore some other, you know, neutrality issues around, you know, deep platforming, for example, it's kind of a, a portion of that there. Um, but then we've got this imbalance between what law enforcement is able to and needs to do because we kind of all, I think Australians all want law enforcement to be empowered to catch people, fix things. But with that is going to come some responsibility around the network, because just like, you know, in the in the mainstream world or the, the real world, the physical world, you know, networks might be freeways and things. The internet is part of that law enforcement task force. And I, it's a challenge I don't um, wish upon myself, let alone any of you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm pretty keen to see the netball on on uh, mainstream, but anyway, it's uh, <laughs> going off. So, with Katina, are you about to say something? Yes, just on this topic, which is uh, very important. Um, this the platforming uh, process that you are describing. Um, I think this has been a long term time coming. You know, the internet was supposed to be for and with the people and by the people. It's become something other than that. And we've known about that at least for a decade now since social media burst onto the scene around about 2006. But now with, with companies that are bigger than countries, I mean, we just have to look at uh, Facebook and look at their ownership of WhatsApp and uh, Instagram. Uh, the changing conditions on Christmas Eve to Instagram were vile. Uh, my children uh, had a quick discussion with me, Mum, do you believe this? And I didn't say a word to them. Uh, and they read back to me the terms and conditions uh, and some of the shocking admonitions of how data would be used. So we're talking about high precision capabilities today to look at traits and behaviours of individuals. So we've got Facebook Messenger, we've got Facebook itself and all the wall uh, posts, we've got Instagram and we've got WhatsApp, we've got everything. And so, you know, Facebook can keep saying we've got end-to-end -end encryption, but not for internal service provisioning purposes. Uh, and then you've got, you know, third party organizations, small startups like Clearview AI saying, well, we're just going to harvest everything that's public, 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 three billion images and see what we can do with that in terms of biometric surveillance uh, and, and use that data for law enforcement initiatives. Uh, I want to see open systems. I think we're going to get back to the point of time, just like when I was studying how many internet service providers there were back in 1998, working for a, a large telecommunications vendor. It was somewhere in the 600 mark, uh, you know, anyone worth knowing uh, offering ISP services. And then we sort of started to buy each other out and we know who the major players are in Australia, but it's definitely not anywhere in the myriad of 100 plus. We have big players now and they've sort of, going back to Lyria's point, are very powerful. But are we going to see a localised solution? Uh-oh. The library's closed. The library closed. Oh, no. It all stalled for me for a second there. Hopefully, uh, Katina will come back shortly. That's um, That was a, a bit of a surprise. Um, okay, so let's keep drilling down a bit on this. Um, we, we certainly do need to make sure that we've got 
good security across the internet and the internet infrastructure, no question whatsoever. Um, we've been doing a lot of work within the IXP to ensure that routing security is there so that we now certify or we check the certification of the routes that originate from the different networks against the, the, um, the database that the um, APNIC, the Asia Pacific Network Information Centre provides so that we know that the traffic coming across our network is genuine, it genuinely comes from the place it said it's supposed to be coming from. And then that way we can assist in making sure that traffic goes where it's supposed to go, that it genuinely comes from where it, it should have come from. And those sorts of things I think are of critical importance to make sure that the infrastructure that we have underneath all of this is, is fundamentally trustworthy and continues to be. Um, Nirol, Nirol, just that's quite fascinating to me because I, as a consumer focused person, I don't really look at the security on the network level. So it's really, um, I guess, reassuring to hear that. And I think it's, I would put it to you that it's similar to what I guess Telstra and the big um, mobile telcos have announced in terms of spam calls and spam SMS. You know, we kind of need at a network level, uh, not responsibility is the wrong word, but some support for consumers because cyber criminals, cyber attacks, scamming, is not going to slow down. So whatever we can do to ensure that people are safe. Uh, and I, you can always think of your elderly parents, grandparents or neighbours, um, let alone the, the younger people or yourself. Yeah. If, there, if there's that extra level of, of safety and security being applied. And I, I sometimes think that overreach is better than underreach in this, in this sense. So that even if we have to block some some stuff to learn, so the wrong stuff, like good stuff to learn that that was good, it's better than blocking less and letting bad stuff through. So I'm I'm supportive of that, and I think that there's a lot that could be done to ensure that people are essentially kept safe without even knowing they're being kept safe. Yeah, it's it's tricky though, isn't it? I mean, there's um, yeah, what is one person's poison is some another person's pleasure. Um, another way to put it, Narelle, yeah. I think would be you know we 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 could get rid of you know cybercrime um, literally tomorrow if that's what we wanted to do, right? We could we could become like you know the, like China, right? We could have huge numbers of government employees scanning every message on the internet. And as soon as someone is seen to send something that's wrong, you know, the people come and knock at your door and you're taken away and never seen again. Um, and, and, and to be honest, I mean, you know, and, and nothing comes in from overseas that's not screened, or, and, you know, with enough money and resources, enough will and a, a not particularly keen interest in democracy, um, we, could, <laughs> we could solve the problem. But I think that the, the challenge, you know, the challenge is, that, that that's the kind of level you'd require to make the internet completely safe. Um, you know, that otherwise you've got to look for other kinds of solutions. So if you're not going to say, you know, we can literally, you know, track, arrest, round up everyone who might commit a crime and block overseas traffic um, in that kind of all controlling way, then you've got to think about actually what are the other ways we can we can what are the other kinds of things we can do so so one thing that we can do a really obvious example is, is just the education um point um and that is you know you know you can do it for sort of whole you know the whole country like the sort of slip slop slap style campaigns right of, of the sort of basic stuff another thing you can do and going back to the the consumer point is easier information at the consumer end um, either when they're, you know, going to an ISP and want to understand stuff or when they're buying, you know, an Internet of Things device that really makes it clear in a visual and helpful way, a bit like nutritional information maybe, um, you know, what, what are the protections on this system, what are its vulnerabilities and that where there is a requirement for honesty about that from providers. So, so there are different things we can do and I'm not sure we're ever going to solve the whole problem any more than we're going to get rid of traffic accidents or something, um, but we can absolutely work towards it. I, I just, I guess I kind of want to push back a little bit against the, you know, we could, you know, just, you know, if we just put locked enough stuff, then we'll catch all the bad stuff and we, that, that, that sort of could be the solution because I think that that kind of way of thinking can, can also be problematic in its own way. Yeah, I mean, it gets down to design thinking and designing for safety, designing for privacy, designing for usability, those sorts of basic principles. Um, okay, then. So, look, we're heading around towards the top of the hour. So I wonder if people want to do some closing thoughts before we um, call out to general folks for, for uh, their questions. I can see a couple of things in the pipeline there. I might prod people a little more to... Um, 
to throw in some extra questions even even if you want to get back to what is your favorite gadget what of the of the coming the coming year that you'd really like to see or to not see um, um, and, and is there something that I should be doing to to harden the exchange to make sure that you know the wrong packets don't get through or or the right ones do um, any thoughts on those sorts of fronts so now Trevor you went first before we could well let's start with you again you, you can um, go do you want to go first again and give us a few minutes to round up no, I don't mind at all. I mean, I, probably just to take a bit of an opportunity to throw in what we were just talking about in terms of deplatforming. I think what we can see is a very big education around both the consumer and governments learning about control. I think we've learned in the last week where we as individuals have control, where businesses have control, and where governments have control. And uh, I, th I think it was Katina that mentioned, you know, a public um, free and open internet. It doesn't exist right now. Um, I think that was a lovely thing back in 95 96 when the internet was this thing of connected boxes and in, in everyone's home but now that we're in the cloud and google and facebook and others control large amounts of data and services that we use it's not what, what it could have or should have or maybe is but learning about the control and look i i'm glad that government and facebook have reached agreement i'm glad that everyone's kind of happy and that's all going to come back but personally it taught me that i don't have control over that yeah. platform. And that's that's not a bad thing. It's their platform. I mean, let's yeah. be very clear. Their platform, their not platform. mine. Mm -hmm. um, but learning from them that I don't have control over my audience on their platform was a really important thing for me to think about every platform and, and everywhere that you engage with, in, in my case, audiences. And I think every business should be thinking about customers in that sense. Where do you own and connect to your customers? Um, and how do you ensure that you have that direct connection that doesn't rely on another platform? And I think that could probably play into your whole industry, which is networks, you know, network wow. redundancy versus, um, you know, network, uh, I guess, outsourcing, you know, where, where do you control what you need to control to ensure that you have a quality of service for your customers? Yeah, they've got some very, very good points. Yes, redundancy. I'm big on redundancy. Not of not of making my staff redundant, but of making my equipment redundant and, and all of our links and services. Great. Thank you for that. That's some really good comments. Um, Katina, you you're back. It's good to see you back to the library. I'm back. <laughs> no, no, it's just the the timing on the phone uh, and the uh, library services. Uh, I'm going to say that we need new innovative business models. You know, we've been practicing in concepts of advertising models. There's nothing really free, that's a misnomer. The internet at the moment is not free, not in the traditional sense. Uh, and so we need to think about different ways of, of working and of being. Um, additionally, as we've seen a lot of young people come online for the first time, uh, there is a international outcry from organizations like UNICEF, even the United Nations, international organizations, but we're going to see something happen in Australia in the next few months, I would say. Uh, I'm the working group chair of the IEEE P2089, which is age appropriate services for young people. And it's not only about safety, it's about child's rights and the rights of young people. Uh, and, you know, we can argue that network providers can wash their hands clean, you know, of certain content on their networks. I'm not talking about internet filtering here, certainly not internet regulation, how we understood it back in the 2013-14 debate uh, with the filtering, uh, even the metadata content surveillance, I'm talking more about the rights of young people. Uh, and each of these young persons are at different, different cognitive capacities. So how do we respond to that as an industry? Uh, and I'm not even talking about cleaning up the internet. It's about the rights of children uh, not to be manipulated. And I'm not even talking about safety alone. So how can we work together in what I'm gonna call digital supply chains in what I'm going to call uh, recognizing the role, you know, uh, of each node in that value chain and responding in a commensurate way that says, I'm responsible, I take public interest uh, seriously, and I innovate responsibly. So they're just a few closing thoughts. There are some challenging ones, so that's for sure. Um, of course, the rush is generally with a lot of the gadgets and things is just to get things out to market, get them out there, try things, fail fast, fail quickly, um, as was mentioned earlier. And it does give us that that real ground for you know a thousand flowers to grow or or 
or not. But you're right, we, we should be able to get a bit more mature about how we deploy technology now. Um, Lyria, have you got some, some closing thoughts for us? I do have some closing thoughts. Um, <laughs> Um, first of all, I, I should have said before, um, because you, you mentioned my book is actually with Michael Guiho, so I've got to do that shout out because otherwise it's, it's, it's like I feel like I'm, I'm stealing half of, half of the book um, or more. Um, so, so, so there's that. But, but back to the, the big questions. Um, I suppose the, the sort of closing thought I'd like to leave um, everyone with from me is, is that the importance of, of understanding what it is people actually want, right? Um, I think that we, do, you know, that, that we have sort of very simplistic mechanisms for that in democracies. You sort of get one vote every four years. And realistically, these sort of issues are not on the top of people's political hit list. So we, we tend, it tends not to sort of play a big part of the picture. But I do think we need to understand what people's concerns are um, in a really concrete way. I also think we need to understand what the laws are, um, because I think there's a lot of, um, you know, a lot of sort of fake ideas about things that float around. Um, you know, some of those are very well known, the sort of BOTPA problem that the Privacy Act does all these things that really it doesn't do. Um, the, the other example I was going to raise, Narelle, was, was from your slide, which is the data ownership um, um, yes. point, which I, I promised you I'd come to and, 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 <laughs> and harangue you for, because the truth is we don't own data. Nobody owns data. Um, I've seen so many contracts, um, you know, with clauses that, you know, ahead of data ownership, you know, we will own all the data you know, maybe contractually you can agree with another party that, that you have certain rights with respect to data because contractually you can do anything at all. But ownership is a word that we use in law when we're talking about rights enforceable against third parties. And there's not many data rights that operate in exactly that way. It's not like I own my phone. I don't own data about me in the same way. And I don't own data I've collected in the same way. Um, they're just the legal regime that operates with respect to data is quite different. And if we want to get it right, and we don't currently have it right, but if we want to get it right, we need to understand where we're at and how it's currently treated. And the fact remains that data is not currently an object of property rights. Right? <laughs> it, it, it just isn't. So, you know, we, we, could, we could change that. I think that would be deeply problematic for many reasons, but we could change that. But we can't change it if people already assume that something, you know, that, 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 that certain words apply when they don't. So, so I think we do, and, and that's you know a little bit of a critique of that one little slide. Very, very unfair on you, Narelle. But, but I do, I suppose, want to make the point that that we do, you know, and these sort of things happen all the time. There's a lot of loose language about what the law is currently doing. And then, the, the the final thing. So, if we understand what people want, and we understand what the law is currently doing, we then need to understand what's currently happening, right? To so the socio-technical world around us and this is where I would love listening to Trevor and Katina at the beginning because they have a much better sense of this than I do but we need to understand all of those things both of the present and of the near and predictable horizon so that we can go back to how the laws currently operate check that against what people actually want and start slowly and not with a six-week turnaround to think about what the solutions might be um, and if we can do all of that I think we can really start to address those big issues I started with right power, democracy, security, and privacy um, in a way that, that works um, both for, um, you know, what governments, you know, I say all three, what governments are looking to do, um, that companies can have a business model that works, and that people are not, you know, are, are being protected in ways they want to be. Well, I, I never thought I'd hear the quote out of one of our sessions that data is not an object of property rights. <laughs> I think I've got that down. Thank you for that one. That is just a, that's a classic one. I never honestly thought I'd expect to hear that. So let's have a look over and see if any of our attendees have got some good questions for us. Um, okay, so we've got one right at the beginning about low or orbit satellite services. People are like, Desperate Meh. to talk about it. <laughs> What's up? I love it. I'm desperate to talk about it. I think it's okay. fascinating. Um, well, people don't, don't know, we're talking about you know, Elon Musk's Elon Starlink, Musk. you know, <laughs> thousands of satellites operating in low orbit to provide internet to the masses. And so, and we talked earlier about, you know, the, the access, the, the universal service obligation, you know, globally, that's, that's a huge issue as well, not just in rural Australia, there's no, no. third world nations that, you know, don't have access to what we do. And that, that could absolutely solve that problem. Um, and I think it's fascinating. I don't think really, I don't think really the, the population of the world know what's coming. I don't think they realize they're about to be surrounded by this mesh 
uh, network of satellites and I think it will freak some people out. Um, I've signed up for the trial for my mum's pub because she's only got NBN satellite and theoretically it's faster. But my, my most fascinating part of this is it's the Elon Musk factor. Now, I, I love what he does, but I think he is a hype uh, magnet. He, you know, his cars have autopilot, which simply doesn't exist. It's not regulated in this country and your car cannot self-drive and should not until it's been regulated properly. Yet he's willing to sell a beta access to a, a, a satellite internet service, which in the terms and conditions, it says that you may experience this period, you may experience periods of inaccessible uh, internet activity because there's gaps in his mesh network already. So yeah. I'm, I want to try it. I want to put it up, put up the dish and have a look. But if someone thinks that in 2021, let alone, frankly, probably 2022, it's going to be the solution to, you know, far reaching internet problems, uh, it's a long way off that, but it will be fascinating to see what speeds he can achieve uh, in mass uh, areas, because obviously, you know, usage depends on on the number of people, but it's going to be awesome to watch because that could challenge a lot of our existing connectivity in rural areas. But hopefully it doesn't mean that existing networks neglect rural areas, just assuming that Elon's got it under control. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I saw that in one of the great science fiction movies, though, a few years back. <laughs> I'm sure it's been, as a concept, it's been around for a while. I mean, we were never going to have enough spaces and geosynchronous orbit anyway were we I mean we had to come flower down and we had to get more of them up there and stuff are going to have to be self-ordering and perhaps move around like swarms above people as people move I think there's some interesting approaches for all of that okay what else have we got here in the question um we've got one here I'm not sure if it's a comment or a question it says how can a company which publishes their content to another company systems and then expect to be paid for it or have content on a website and this be read by another company's systems they expect to be paid when they have not asked for their system not to read the data. So what would he be referring to, Morel? <laughs> I can't imagine. No idea. <laughs> I've, got, I've got a comment on that one, um, if I can, um, which is that um, because we get to make the rules, right? Um, so, you know, absolutely the current rules, if we take away all the things the Australian government trying to do with new legislation would be, that's absolutely right. Um, but we get to make the rules. So I'm not saying what the rules should be because I don't have a personal view on that. And clearly, the, you know, the question has one view and I'm sure everyone in this room and, and online room, whatever the word is, um, would have would have a view on this. And, and, you know, there's been lots of commentary in the public as well. Um, but I think the, the core point is, I mean, it would be open to the government to pass a law that, that said, no, you do have to pay for that, right? We, we, that we, we, I don't want to lose the fact in all of this debate, and whether they, the government should or shouldn't is another question, but I don't want to lose the fact in all this debate that if we have a democratic government, they can pass laws and they can say that if you do certain things, there are financial consequences of doing those things. And as long as they do that within the limits of the Australian legislative power, if you like, um, then they can do it. Um, and that's what being a in a democracy is all about. So I, I, I agree that maybe we don't want those rules and we don't want that to be the answer, quite possibly. But I guess I worry about the idea that we want to, you know, that, that we that we sort of say things should be a particular way, maybe, but I, I think we have to acknowledge the power of governments, democratically elected governments, to do what yeah. they think is 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 that the, the that right answer. Yeah, in, indeed. And we, we've looked at the evolution of the NBN. Um, I had somebody arguing with me recently about how, oh, the NBN, it's, you know, it's not what it should be. And I had some very nice fellas in my front yard yesterday digging it up, trying to uh, run some fibre down the down to the back of the house. Um, and governments have the right to enact the policy in the way that they they believe they've been um, empowered to do so. Totally. That's and Narelle, I think that that I've probably had that question. I don't know. 25,000 times in the last <laughs> seven days, um, because it's it's a critical thing, right? Us. Individuals, we share on Facebook and no one determines whether or not we should or shouldn't. So we've got this right. And so yeah. people see media companies banging on the door for money when it's their choice to share things on the platform. But you kind of need to rewind a little. And, and let me be clear, I sat on the feds on this code for years. Um, I was tipped over to the media side, the government side, um, when I tried to get all four parties, media, ACCC, Facebook and Google in one place on one show to talk about it. And Facebook and Google refused. Now, the fact that they don't want to talk about it 
makes me suspicious. And so I was able to listen in great detail to the government and the media argument. And look, this is what it comes down to. The problem is separate media and just talk about news, newsroom. A newsroom in any business doesn't make money. You can't make money out of news, okay? Because you can't sell ads in news. You can't, just news alone doesn't make money. So if media companies struggle to make money or are losing more money than they than they relatively should be, then news will be the first thing that's cut. Whether that's two journalists or a hundred, it's yeah. too many. Yeah. And so what we're trying to do is protect journalism. And the only way to do that is say, why are we not making money? Well, because Facebook and Google have 80% of the digital advertising market. They have market power in the digital advertising space, which makes it hard for media companies to make money. And the reason they have that market power is because we all as citizens use the internet, use Google and use Facebook to read, share um, and click on news items, which gives Facebook and Google an extraordinary amount of data about their users, which they would not otherwise have. And that means that the media companies don't have that same access to data and therefore, the, the advertising is hard to get. So what we're saying is we're essentially taxing their advertising revenue because they're using our personal information to make money in this country. And I think in the end, we get a reasonable outcome that is Facebook win because they got amendments. Government wins because they passed a code and media is going to get paid. Media wins because they're going to get paid. And the Australian public, frankly, don't need to worry about it. I just think that we've had a reasonably good outcome, um, but we need to watch this in a few years because Facebook have retained the right to turn news off again at any point they want. Okay. I think um, I'm just going to poll here and to see if there are any more questions because I'm not seeing any more through just at the moment. If there are any other questions from attendees, um, please feel free to either post them into the, the Q&A uh, or the, the chat channel. We're having a look. Um, I will also announce who's won the lucky door prize while I've got it here and just scanning through the list. Uh, George, George Coldham, congratulations. You have a wonderful little device coming your way. Um, again, I've forgotten what they're called. Someone's going to have to remind me what they're called. They're these great little, um, I thought they were Microtik routers, which come with Wi-Fi and the whole works. They're really little and wonderful. Uh, and Paul Ramsey, if you're still here, Yes, Paul, you and George, you've, you've won the, um, the lucky door prize tonight. So that's great. If, uh, are there any more questions from folks that we can have posted into the chat and I'll make sure people answer them? <laughs> George has said, yay, he's happy to, to win that prize. People always like getting them. And uh, I do have a couple of announcements too on closing that I mustn't forget to make. <laughs> so unless anybody's got any questions, I'll make those quick announcements. Um, one is a reminder that Apricot, one of the premier networking conferences for the region, the Asia Pacific Regional Internet Conference, um, you know, maybe a bit more boring for, for Lyria, but um, for the rest of us, network engineers, it's a fun place to be where we get in touch with a lot of our colleagues right across the region. Last year it was in Melbourne and we sort of got in just before the borders closed and just before it got scary. And unfortunately, I was altogether too well read on WHO papers by the time, you know, that the, uh, the conference was on. Um, but Apricot is on next week. It is online completely. Uh, so anybody can can uh, can join it. And we're sponsors again this year for it. Um, another quick one for our members is that um, uh, I'm going to name a name of a big a big member, and that's Amazon. Uh, so Amazon's probably you got off lightly in the discussion this evening, but Amazon are a great member of ours. They have um, um, they got some great services. We've got cloud direct connect services from uh, Amazon to our other members, and they've just doubled their capacity. Uh, well, more than doubled. They've they've got uh, redundant links now in place in Perth, and they're also putting on a, in a second rink link into our Victorian exchange, internet exchange, and they're 100 gig everywhere now. So folks, if you want to suck great content and deliver great services out of Amazon's systems, do get in touch with Amazon and um, set up your, your uh, bilateral peering. So, uh, and again too, we, our next event will be towards the end of April. It's on BGP fundamentals and probably some more deeper tech stuff in there that we'll throw in. So please come along to that. And of course, I do have to thank our panelists. It's been a fantastic discussion. Um, some great, what a, I mean, what a rock star panel again. I'm really, we're really privileged to have you. I'm just thrilled to, um, thrilled to have you on board. It's been great to, to have you join us. 
I'm sure we've got a bunch of other folks um, on Facebook too that uh, have been enjoying it without getting access to the chat, folks. So uh, next time, join us direct. Um, once again, thank you to to Liria, Professor Liria Bennett Moses of the uh, the University of New South Wales, to Trevor Long of EFTM. Um, and uh, Katina Michael, who's at the Arizona State University these days. And it's it's probably your sleepy time right now since you're teaching all night. I really appreciate you staying up for it. So what we're going to do now is to end the Facebook stream. That's your cue, Nick. Turn it off, please. <laughs>